So this tweet went viral over on Lefty Twitter. No, I'm never calling it X. Get over it, Elon. If you're a leftist, you need to be working out four to five times a week and learning self-defense, along with organizing with neighbors and your local community for defense, food sovereignty, and community defense. Kind of repeating yourself there. There's no excuse not to do something to strengthen your body daily. This tweet was, um, pretty poorly received by this person's comrades. So much so that they locked down their account. You love to see it. Now, this is a sentiment that I've seen crop up every so often in the online left. Probably the most memorable instance to me I unfortunately don't have a screenshot of, as it happened back in 2016, after Trump just got elected. If you were involved in politics back then, you probably remember the irrational leftist meltdown at Trump's victory. One take that stands out in my memory was of some soy boy city dweller stating that now that the left had lost and America was officially a fascist country, leftists must retreat from large cities and their militarized fascist police force in order for the socialist movement to survive. He advocated for every leftist in America who came from a small town and moved out to the big city in order to escape their oppressive families and bigotry and the church and whatever else to return back to those hometowns and prepare for the Civil War. Stockpile food and weapons, educate the old friends they left behind on communist theory, learn the local lay of the land, and begin a widespread working class insurrection against the federal government. Needless to say, this didn't happen. But every once in a while, whenever the left underperforms in an election, or is projected to underperform, this take reappears. For example, Vosh spent a ton of time on his streams leading up to the 2022 midterms, advocating that leftists arm up and prepare for civil war. This is no longer a political conflict which can be won exclusively through, you know, um, tra traditional institutionalist political discourse. Isn't that exactly how Republicans won it, though? Through traditional institutions? through voting in a president who was able to put in a lot of Supreme Court justices that agreed with him. I do mm -hmm. think we're in the preliminary stages of a genocide. <laughs> what? I, what do you mean by that, Vouch? In two years before the next midterm, you're saying they would pass stuff that would actually pretty much kill democracy. What midterm? Do you, I'm saying if you, if they, 2024, 2026. What midterm? You, I don't think you understand, and this is why I use the rhetoric that I do. We're up, times up, you squash fascistic movements by winning the violent clashes. Hmm. So your political plan it's is just violence. to prepare for war, a civil war, and then fight it. I don't know if a civil war is the right- I like how he's such a fucking coward that he won't fucking own what he's talking about at least. What a fucking loser. Just say yes. That's what you want. You're waiting for the civil war and you want people to fucking prepare for it. Just say that. Don't be such a little pussy ass bitch and cower away from it so much. Remember during the Black Lives Matter rallies, you know, there were like those Patriot Prayer dumb fucks rolling their, you know, $60,000 trucks through like urban neighborhoods with a bunch of guys with guns in the pickup trucks. When that happens, I want people to be able to take shots at them from apartment windows. Take shit, they weren't sh there's no, if you wanna drive around with guns, you have the right to do that in the United States, even during protests. What do you mean you want people shooting at them for doing it? Jesus Christ. Though socialists call themselves the champions of democracy to the point that they claim to desire it more than liberals do, when their ideas inevitably lose at the ballot box, they are more than happy to resort to violence. Of course, there are extremists on the right who advocate for similar things. I also remember a very striking post from back in 2008, where a rightoid advocated for getting the boys together, hopping into the back of a pickup truck, and driving town to town in his local area, executing anybody who voted for Obama. That obviously didn't happen either. But the difference between the left and the right on the topic of getting ready for the Civil War is that the right will actually do it. As for the left? Well, you only have to read the replies that original tweet received from their fellow leftists. A fascist worked out today. Did you? Um, body fascism isn't leftist. This doesn't really take into account the disabled left taking the okay. Some of us can't disable this A few other leftists jumped into the conversation, understanding the original point, namely that you can't expect to be a revolutionary if you're not fit enough to even fucking fight in a revolution. They even use one of Marx's most famous quotes, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. Though the original was faculties, not ability, the meaning's the same. The idea here is that every revolutionary has an obligation to do what they're able to do. Even if the disabled revolutionary can't lift nearly as much as the Chad revolutionary, he should still do what he can. But the backlash didn't stop. The vast majority of online socialists were incensed with this take. They took the idea that they would have to put in some of the effort required for their socialist revolution to come to pass very personally. And the question is, why? 
There's a pretty good surface level reply that mostly answers the question, and it should be good for most casual discussions of this topic. Remember like a year ago when I did that video on r slash anti work, the subreddit devoted to people who are refusing to work or doing the bare minimum at their jobs or not putting up with their bullshit bosses? You know, the place that ended up being run by a balding, non-binary sex pest? Well, the socialist movement used to fetishize labor. You probably know what I mean. The worker as a lionized individual. Heroic artwork made of strong men working in factories or fields, confronting the bourgeois oppressor with righteous violence. That sentiment is largely gone from the socialist movement of today, and has been replaced with the lionization of laziness instead. There is a growing view on the left that refusing to work, choosing instead to be a burden on society instead of a contributor, will hasten capitalism's destruction, that being a leech is socialist activism. I'll go into detail on the left's fetishization of laziness in a future video, since it does deserve a deeper explanation. But for now, I'll quickly refer to our buddy Vosh again, where he talks about this tendency while reacting to a video about Marxist theory. Also, inheritance would be abolished, and there would also be equal obligation for everyone to work. And as Marx described it, the government would increasingly intervene with our incurc. There's something that has uh, outdated somewhat, no? Most, um, most uh, socialists these days are some flavor of anti-work, unless they're one of those Pat Soak or Dengis types where they're really just... Um, fascists or capitalists with uh, with a mask on. Equal obligation of all to work is also a little bit incompatible with the sentiment, um, you know, uh, from each according to their ability to each according to their need. Depending on how broad your definition is for work, if they are ensuring that everybody works the same amount, what system is being put in place to do so? Are there critiques here of the mechanisms of the police or of law? and how that might reinforce systems of inequality. If you have a legal structure in a state that is ensuring equal work for all, how do you prevent that state from just designating certain people in charge of labor allocation and then allowing them to acquire more power? Anyone with a brain can see the problem, of course. If your society is set up such that you are able to take whatever you want from it without being required to give something back, you have a society of consumers with no producers producing the products being consumed. Having to buy the stuff that you're consuming is one way to ensure that the people consuming are also doing some producing. Pointing guns at them and forcing them to fulfill work orders is another way, which is how anti-capitalists of all different stripes tended to get it done in practice. Something that Vosh admits in that clip. He doesn't see the irony. The anti-work argument explains most of the backlash our socialist gym-goer received, but there is one series of tweets that can gateway us towards the other reason. Amazing how you call yourself a leftist, but this whole thread absolutely stinks of conservative bootstrap ideology. Like, damn, have you not heard of disability, chronic illness, food insecurity? What about people who work two to three jobs? Okay, most of this is just the same cope as before, making all sorts of excuses as to why you can't go to the gym. In fact, it even brings up some fat activist talking points. After my last video on those freaks, I thought I wouldn't be discussing them again for a little while. But that first sentence is the important one. Amazing how you call yourself a leftist, but this whole thread absolutely stinks of conservative bootstrap ideology. Bootstrapping, in a very general sense, refers to a self-starting process that grows without external input. Here's where it comes from. Boots often have straps on them, allowing you to easily put them on with a finger, pulling the entrance of the boot open. The phrase, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, dates back to at least the 19th century, but seems to have been in use before that. An issue of the Chicago Union newspaper, Working Man's Advocate, wrote in 1934 that someone, quote, will now be enabled to hand himself over the Cumberland River or a barnyard fence by the straps of his boots. The phrase was used to describe an impossible task, and at the time of print seems to be a common saying. The American author Horatio Algier, who specialized in writing rags to riches stories about poor young men working hard and overcoming their circumstances, began the trend of using the phrase, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, to describe not an impossible event, but a possible one, improving your situation by sheer force of will. It's this meaning of the word bootstrap that is stuck in the English language. The idea of a self-starting process, or a positive feedback loop, or something that creates or replicates itself. In business, bootstrapping a business means starting a business without external labor or capital, relying entirely on only your own money and energy. In law, bootstrapping refers to the improper use of evidence in a second crime. For example, if a person is charged with two crimes, the evidence in crime one can't be used in the case for crime two, unless there is evidence that specifically bridges the two crimes into a single case. In computer programming, bootstrapping refers to language compilers that are coded in the same language that they compile. 
In fact, computers boot up when you turn them on because the boot process is one in which the initial jolt of power activates an extremely simplistic sequence of commands, which then serves to start up a more complicated program. And this process iterates until the entire computer is up and running. Believe it or not, the on button for the first computers was labeled the bootstrap button. Socialists hate the idea of bootstrapping themselves into a better position in life for a few key reasons. One, some socialists believe that it's actually impossible. Things definitionally cannot get better on an individual level for anybody who is a member of the proletariat, because Marxist theory predicts that the material conditions of the proletariat will decline until revolution becomes necessary. Therefore, if your life is getting better, it's not because you made it better by your own work. That's impossible. It's either that you've joined the bourgeois and you're now a class enemy, or you're lying about your improved status, either for some material gain or because you have a mental illness. Two. There are some other socialists who believe that while bootstrapping is possible for some people, it's not possible for others. Therefore, because it's not something that everybody has equal access to, it should be abolished. In other words, your greater ability to improve your life versus somebody who can't improve theirs should not actually lead to you living a more materially prosperous life. Any increased material wealth generated by your efforts shouldn't solely be enjoyed by you, but instead by everybody. In both of these interpretations, if you do actually manage to bootstrap yourself, you are perpetuating the capitalist system by being complicit with it. In the first, you've either become a capitalist or what the Marxists called an anti-social, somebody made mentally ill by capitalism. In the second, you aren't following the anti-work screed of laziness as accelerationist praxis. The third reason, though, is the most important one. It's because it's fascist. Yes, we're back on the everything is fascism or everything is right wing train. Lifting weights is fascist. I know you've seen those articles saying so. Hallmark movies are fascist. They're schmaltzy fascism, in fact. Christianity is fascist. Forget the fact that Mussolini was an atheist and Hitler had some weird occult beliefs going on. Comedy is fascist, too, especially if you make fun of socialists. Then it's really fascist. Historical figures from before fascism, like Washington, he's a fascist. Historical figures that fought fascism, like Churchill, he's also a fascist. Two-parent households are fascists. Hey, remember that nonsense from young anarchists like last year who declared that bedtimes and having to shower are fascist, too? What's going on here? On the surface, it's pretty clear that fascist is simply being used as an insult. On the internet, it's known as Godwin's Law. The American historians Stanley Payne and Bruce Kicklick have both commented on the phenomenon of leftists calling everything fascist. Even back in fascism's day, George Orwell remarked the same. The leftists of his day simply called everything not them fascist. When used as a pejorative, the word fascist is just a way to browbeat people into compliance by slapping them with a label already considered evil. And some of the problems that we see nowadays are due to that strategic overuse of the term, like racist or sexist before it. But it's not just being used as an insult. Oftentimes, these people do actually believe they are properly labeling their targets as fascist. This tends to happen more with anarchist socialists than authoritarian socialists. Both of these groups do position themselves as the complete opposite of fascism. The tankies do regularly decry fascism online, though some of them do actually embrace the fascists as brothers. Those who don't make pretty unconvincing attempts at proclaiming themselves as fascism's opposite, considering that they do almost the exact same shit as the fascists do. But the anarchist claim as being the opposite of fascism is a lot stronger, and it's this belief of theirs that leads to some very weird stuff. If we were to write down a list of fascist virtues, what would they be? I don't mean the virtues of any specific fascist movement. Germany was anti-Semitic, but the leftists who believe Israel to be fascist would not call Israel anti-Semitic. Italy was irredentist and expansionist, but Spain was isolationist and sequestered. What I mean is, if you could list a shorthand of general fascist virtues, what would be on that list? If I personally had to guess, it would be something like strength, masculinity, discipline, order, hierarchy, violence, national or ethnic solidarity, virility. I'm probably missing others, but this'll do. Fascists are considered the ultimate evil in our modern understanding of politics, and not without good reason. When anarchist leftists position themselves as the opposite of fascism, they generally take up the extreme opposite position of whatever the fascists viewed as virtuous. Look at that list again. Strength? The anarchist leftists take up weakness as a virtue. Look at them farm clout off of claims that they have mental problems or dysphoria or PTSD or whatever else. Look at them professing they can't actually hit the gym, and it's bigoted to expect them to. For these people, weakness is the virtue. Masculinity? That's an easy one from the sacred feminine of the old radical feminists to how common it is to transition or cross-dress or otherwise subvert gender roles. The anarchists consider it moral to be anti-masculine. Discipline? I'll refer back to Vosh for the third time today. Can you guess what other video I'm currently working on right now, guys? And when I'm feeling very depressive, I'm not very productive. But in the brief moments of lucidity that I can manage even while feeling depressive, I'm more productive in one hour than a lot of you stupid pieces of shit are in a goddamn day even when I'm feeling depressive. And do you know why? It's because in addition to being depressive, I'm also a f adult. 
and I know how to go, okay, as long as I can, this, 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 do it, do it, do it, go, let's do a podcast while I do it, kablamo, work done. But I see a lot of people, in addition to being depressive, have no idea how to structure their behavior or be productive, and for that reason, it gets way harder. This is what I mean when I say discipline is freedom. When you're feeling depressive, discipline is what lets you get your chores done in one hour instead of four. Discipline is what lets you take care of everything you need to do in the house so you have free time rather than having the the, the, the the mental burden of future work weighing on you the entire time that you're sitting there doing nothing. This time, Vosh, an anarchist leftist with an equally anarchist left community, was arguing with his chat over bootstraps. He's had this argument several times over the years. I only found this one video, but I remember at least two other instances going viral, where Vosh made the claim that doing the bare minimum to take care of yourself was necessary, while his chat turned on him and called him a bootstrapper. To these people, the anarchist virtue, as the opposite of the fascist one, must be to reject discipline and embrace indulgence and helplessness. Order? Anarchy is quite literally a state of disorder. Hierarchy? They view it as unjust and oppressive. Some less extreme people on the left might say, we only want to abolish the unjust hierarchies and those people would be purged in the revolution as the next fascists hiding in the midst of the left. Totalizing equality means nobody gets to be better than anybody else, and a great way to achieve that is a total state of disorder. Violence? There's a strong streak of pacifism in some anarchist movements, though this isn't consistently true for all of them. But even in the anarchist movements that aren't violent, they always frame their violence as defensive, even when it's not, and they never worship violence as its own goal the way fascists do. National or ethnic solidarity? The anarchists are almost always internationalists. Those groups on the left that lean towards national or ethnic solidarity, like black nationalists for example, they also lean towards fascism themselves. Virility? This one's the strangest one of all. There's certainly a strong anti-natalist streak on the left, with some of them even viewing it as immoral to create more people. But nonetheless, anarchist leftists, when they are sexually active, which is hit or miss with them, they tend to be extremely degenerate in their sexuality. This isn't a conceptual problem though, because the fascists also valued chastity in their own weird way, due to the conflicting necessities of creating the next generations of soldiers and laborers, opposing their need to reject degeneracy, the fascists tended to value pleasureless sex, at least in their political theory. In other words, the fascists wanted virile men and submissive women who would use sex for children but not pleasure, while the anarchists want sexually uninhibited, sterile, genderless beings who use each other for pleasure but never actually procreate. Now that the list is completely laid out, it's easy to see what's going on here. The anarchist leftist hates the fascist so much that their highest moral good is the opposite of anything the fascist values, even though in reality, these things can all be good or bad depending on circumstance. And personally, I don't think it's a good idea to cede concepts like discipline or masculinity or strength solely to the fascists. All right, editing dev here. I just wanted to cut in real quick, just in case you think this is all kind of out to lunch. While I was collecting the sources for this video, I quite literally bumped into a guy on Twitter saying pretty much this exact thing. Once you understand the fact that anarchist leftists adopt anything that is the opposite of fascism as the good, their behavior becomes very predictable. Especially once you realize that they also view everything not them as a range of different fascisms whose distinguishing features don't actually matter. The police are evil because fascists like police. The state is evil because the fascists like the state. The family is evil because the fascists like the family. Tradition is evil because fascists like tradition, or at least the anarchists think they did. The actual truth is more complicated. And lifting weights and getting swole has to be evil too, because the fascists valued physical fitness. That's the core of what's going on here. Yeah, a lot of them are just lazy. Some of them are probably legitimately disabled. Others are likely both lazy and disabled at the same time, meaning that they're actually disabled, and that does give them a good excuse to not do anything. But they're still not doing what they could do, and they know it. And most of this backlash comes from that deep place of insecurity, where they know that they're not everything that they could be. This also explains why people who promote self-help stuff like Jordan Peterson, at least older Jordan Peterson, simultaneously help people and de-radicalize them out of socialism. Generally, people are socialists because they believe that bootstrapping is impossible. They'll never make it. It's all society's fault and someone else has to fix it, not them. But once people get that first taste of success, once they actually get even just a minor victory that was won legitimately by their own actions, a lot of the other socialist stuff that was built up around their own weakness tends to fall away as the weakness does. The ideology serves to justify the weakness, but it also can't exist without that weakness. That's why this stuff is such a vicious cycle. These are weak people, but their politics demand that they reject self-improvement because those politics are perpetuated by the weakness. If their politics are morally correct, and they believe they are, then it becomes a moral obligation to be a weak person. To move past your own weakness, to even desire that, that's a rejection of the morality. 
Other socialists like Vosh or that weightlifter guy from the beginning, they are ultimately correct about self-improvement. And there's absolutely other forms of socialism that don't worship weakness as anti-fascist praxis. But the most common variant online right now does. Tragically, the people who are persuaded by this idea end up destroying themselves on its altar.